I don't want to grow up, I'm a curious kid. The world has a hundred questions I can play with. So I'll open my arms and eyes and wonder every day till the day I die. No All right, our speakers tonight, we're very lucky to have two. We're having a dialogue tonight. First up is Lauren Weiss. She is Trottier Postdoctoral Fellow at the Institute for Research on Exoplanets at the University of Montreal. Dr. Weiss earned her PhD at UC Berkeley, go Bears, and she has developed deep expertise in the attributes of small exoplanets. Our second speaker, Mark Pinsonneau, is Professor of Astronomy at The Ohio State University. Dr. Pinsonneau earned his PhD at Yale University. For decades, he has been recognized as a leading expert on the structure and evolution of stars. By the way, Dr. Pinsonneau and Dr. Weiss can be called Kepler mission experts. They are part of a diverse team of Kepler contributors that has discovered some 2,300 planets, confirmed planets. William Herschel discovered one planet in, 17, in the 1700s, 1781, I believe. He discovered the planet Uranus, not pronounced, alas, Uranus. <laughs> it really is Uranus. But that made him a living and, in fact, later on, a dead legend in astronomy. Tonight, you're going to hear talks by two people that contributed to the discovery of more than 2,000 planets. This is a, a, a wondrous occurrence. Please join me in welcoming our first speaker, Dr. Lauren Weiss. <laughs> Wow, thank you. Thank you so much all for being here. Thank you so much to Tucker and for Wonderfest for hosting me. Um, it's, uh, it's a real treat to be back in the Bay Area. So tonight, um, I hope we can have a, a little chat about uh, some of the things that we've learned about exoplanets and about stars from Kepler. So um, my talk tonight will be about Kepler's insights into the sizes and compositions of exoplanets. So, of course, we, uh, we have some thoughts about planets, but most of those come from our solar system, in which we have the gas giants, Jupiter and Saturn, the ice giants, Uranus and Neptune, and uh, the terrestrial planets. So one question that I often wonder is, do other stars have planets that are like these, and indeed whole systems of planets like our own solar system? Um, I've had the, the fortune of camping in Yosemite before. Uh, I don't know if you've made it out there. Unfortunately, I, I am not talented enough to take this photograph. A friend of mine did. But I think, I at least hope that you've all had the experience of staring at a dark sky like this with the Milky Way and wondering about which of these stars might have planets. Now, as beautiful as the night sky is, I'm certainly not talented enough to just look at these stars and discern whether or not they have planets. The stars are often a million times brighter than the nearby planets that they might host. And so at the moment, directly imaging uh, some of the nearest and smallest planets to stars uh, is, is still just a bit out of our reach. So I want to ask you, as people who are full of wonder and curiosity and innovation, how would you do it? How would you find planets around these stars? Are there any ideas? Anyone brave? Yeah. SETI technique. So SETI is the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And while SETI objects often encompass looking for planets, they're mostly interested in um, receiving uh, radio communication from uh, possible civilizations. They haven't found any yet. Um, I'll tell you when they do. Yeah, fingers crossed. Um, but uh, as Tucker alluded to, we have found exoplanets. So are there any ideas about how we might find planets around these stars? Yeah. Awesome. So, um, so what, what is a transit? Oh, when the planet goes in front of the star from our view. 
cool, super. Uh, did you see the transit of Venus? Oh, bummer, okay. Well, hopefully you're gonna invent a way to live a really long time, because um, by the time the next one happens, I might not be here anymore, we'll see. Um, yeah, transits of Venus come in pairs and happen about every century. So we have to wait roughly 100 years for the next one. Uh, but this was the transit of Venus in 2012, uh, which I saw. So this is our sun, and the black uh, circle here is Venus transiting across the sun. And these, this is just time-lapse photography of Venus in different positions across the sun. So um, to understand the transit technique a little bit better, we're going to make a model solar system here and observe it. Cool, okay. So um, I'm using my, uh, my laptop here as our telescope. And uh, this lamp will be a star. And you can see on the screen capture that uh, the star is uh, positioned in, uh, in this aperture here. And of course, that aperture actually corresponds to my webcam right here. So what we're going to do is move planets to transit the star. So I'm going to need a, a volunteer to help with this. Yeah? Yeah, come on up. <laughs> What's your name? Winnie. Winnie? And what was your name, by the way? Tina? Thanks so much, Tina and Winnie, for, uh, for helping out. Would microphones help them, or should they, they just need to move? Um, they, I think they just need to move. We can, we can share a microphone. So, um, all right. So, Winnie, you are going to be in charge of making a planet orbit its star. So I, I'll let you select the planet of your choice here. Cool. And why don't you, why don't you give that sort of a, a practice orbit around the star? Cool, yeah, and check and make sure you're transiting here. So you're probably figuring out already as, the, as a watchful audience that uh, there are plenty of ways for a planet to not transit the star. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is hit this button, Capture Data. And you can, keep, uh, you can keep on orbiting, Winnie. And I'm just going to capture some data here. And we can actually see that when the planet transits the star, it does, in fact, block a little bit of the light. So I hope that as you're watching this, you're making some predictions about when the next transit's going to be. Any thoughts about that? All right, cool. Thanks so much, Winnie. All right, uh, can I get another volunteer? Yeah, come on up. <laughs> sure, why not? Every night's girl's night. What's your name? Gabrielle, thanks, uh, thanks so much for helping out. All right, so this, this was the planet that Winnie used. Now, Gabrielle, I'd like you to choose a different planet. All right, so uh, to the audience, um, here's the planet that Winnie used, and here's Gabrielle's planet. So I'd like you to make a prediction. When Gabrielle makes her planet orbit, do you think the dips that we observe in the star's light will be bigger dips or smaller dips. Cool, let's see what happens. So I just need to reset this quickly. If you want, you can get, uh, get a practice orbit going. Yeah. Yeah, you might need to come a little bit higher. Cool. All right, let's try this out. Cool, thanks, Gabrielle. Take a, take a look at that. 
There's your planet. <laughs> All right, nice job. All right, can we have a big hand for Winnie and Gabrielle? All right, now uh, this is Wonderfest, and I hope that uh, your sense of wonder is somewhat awakened here. So if any of you have any experiments that you would like to try with our convenient exoplanet laboratory setup, you can come up here and do them. Just, just let me know if you've got something you want to try. You're all good? What about, like, yeah. Two planets. Do you want to come on up again? All right, so we've got Winnie up again, and I'm going to need one more volunteer. Tina, come on up. All right, so, uh, so this is going to be a little tricky to coordinate, so you're going to have to figure out which planet's on the inside and which one's on the outside. All right, you guys want to get your orbits started? We'll uh, get this going. <laughs> you might need two hands, that might help. <laughs> Yeah, see if you can get them lined up. Cool. All right, let's try this. Awesome, thanks. <laughs> cool, everyone, let's give Winnie and Tina a big round of applause for that. <laughs> All right, so um, does someone want to tell me what you, what you observe here in this beautiful data set? Yeah? The larger the planet, what? The larger the planet makes more of a difference than the smaller. Yeah, the larger planet makes a bigger dip, right? Cool, what's your name? What? Vicky. Yeah, nice observation, Vicky. That's, that's, that's correct. And so we, we don't actually ever see these planets directly to see what size they are. So we need to use indirect methods like measuring the depth in the, the dip in the light curve. That's what we call this kind of plot is a light curve because it's the curve of the light of the star. So we make these observations in order to infer the sizes of the planets. Are there any other observations people want to make about the data set? Uh, so, I would be interested in the frequency. So mm -hmm. we, we look at the dips and then look at the distance to each other. And maybe that's somehow interesting. Yeah. But yeah, that's right. So, so planets have a, a typical period with which they orbit the star. The orbital period of Earth is one year, meaning that every year, in, we are passing the same point in space, in what we call sidereal space. Um, and, and different planets in the same, that are orbiting the same star will have uh, slightly different orbital periods. If they had the same orbital period, they would run into each other, and then there wouldn't be two planets there. So, but from actually um, seeing multiple transits of each planet, we can make predictions about when the next transit is going to be. Okay, so now you guys are all um, pretty expert on how, on how transits work. So let's talk a little bit about Kepler. So Kepler is a spacecraft that, uh, that was launched for the very purpose of measuring these kinds of transits. All righty, Kepler. So what's special about... Oh,
All right, here we go. Cool. All right, so Kepler um, is basically a, it's a, a telescope in space, and the most, one of the most important pieces of equipment on Kepler is its detector, uh, which is shaped like this. There it is getting assembled in the clean room. And this detector was designed to have the sensitivity to light such that it could detect dips in the light of 20 parts per million, which is the size of signal that Earth makes when it orbits the sun. Kepler was launched in 2009 on a Delta II rocket. And then it stared at 150,000 stars for four years. So this is um, uh, an image showing actually where starlight from various stars fall on that beautiful detector. Within the first few months of staring, Kepler had already discovered several planets. So here are the uh, sort of artists' renditions of the stars and the, the corresponding planets. And then, of course, these, these dip things are the actual data from Kepler. And again, you can, you can sort of see, ah, the bigger planets are making the bigger dips. And this one, this one over here is like really small. I don't know if you can see that. And then it's got that tiny little dip. So Kepler did this. Uh, it, of course, was looking at 150,000 stars. As you notice, transits only happen when the planet lines up precisely between the star and the telescope. Um, so Kepler didn't find 150,000 planets, but it did find thousands. And here's an artist's uh, representation of some of the stars and then the silhouettes that their transiting planets uh, were making across the stars. Now, we might start asking some questions about the physical properties of these planets. What are their sizes as determined by the depth of the dip and their orbital periods as determined by the frequency with which the transits occurred? So we can put these planets on a, on a plot showing these two parameters. So our axis here is showing the size of the planet. Big planets like Jupiter-sized planets are up at the top. Neptune-sized planets are here. Earth-sized planets are here. And then orbital period uh, is in the x direction. So a one-day period is here, 10 days here. Uh, and then Earth period out at like 365 days would be right about here. So you can see that Kepler found planets of various sizes and in many orbits, many of which are much closer to their stars than Earth is to the sun. Let's take a, a closer look at the sizes of the planets. So we can just count up how many planets of different sizes did Kepler find. And uh, Kepler found uh, a few sort of Jupiter-sized planets and larger, but a lot of planets the size of Neptune and smaller, all the way down to Earth-sized planets, which is the limit of Kepler's sensitivity. But as you just learned from our demo, the small planets, because they make the smaller dips, are going to be hard to find, whereas the big planets are easy to find. So the goal of Kepler was to come up with an accurate measurement of what fraction of stars in the galaxy have planets the size of Earth in an orbit like Earth. So to make that calculation, you have to do a correction. So the smaller planets um, were missed more frequently than the big planets. So this red bar is just showing how many planets were missed as a function of size. And this is calculated through detailed data analysis and statistics. So my colleague, Eric Pettigura, who's actually speaking at an event tomorrow, led this study. It won a paper of the year in, um, in a major physics journal. And the result is this. One in five sun-like stars has an Earth-like planet, meaning a planet between um, one and two times the size of Earth in a, a roughly Earth-like orbital period. So what that means for you and for me 
is that when we go camping at Yosemite on a lovely summer night and look up at the stars, we can make a bet that one in five of the stars that's like the sun has a planet like Earth. So this is really emotional for me, but um, as a scientist, I have to keep, uh, keep a little bit skeptical. And remember that just because a planet is the size of Earth does not mean that it has an Earth-like composition. So we would like to know which of the small planets are rocky. And to do that, we want to compute their densities. And to do that, we need to measure both uh, the planet's size, which we can convert to a volume, but also the planet mass. So um, I don't have time to go into this right now, but you can ask me more about it in the questions period. Um, I actually uh, worked with my team while I was a PhD student to measure the masses and densities of what has now risen to over 100 small planets. And what we learned from this study is that planets that are uh, planets that are larger than one and a half times the size of the Earth are probably not rocky. Whereas planets that are smaller than about one and a half times the size of the Earth are fairly likely to be rocky. So, uh, so that's pretty cool, but uh, it actually gets better. So uh, a few years ago when, uh, when Eric uh, did his work, if we counted up the number of um, planets of different sizes, the distribution looked something like this. So not that many really large planets, and then there were quite a few planets smaller than Neptune. But our team has just finished a six-year campaign to measure the sizes of stars. And Mark's going to talk more about this in just a couple minutes. But of course, stars are really important because, well, we only used one particular size of star in the experiment we did here. But you could imagine that if I used a larger star or a smaller star, that would change the size of the dip for a given size of planet. So knowing accurate stellar sizes is really important for understanding planet sizes. We've just finished a six-year campaign in which we measured accurate stellar sizes. And as a result, this is the new distribution just published this week of the number of planets as a function of planet size. And what's really striking here is we have identified for the first time a gap in the distribution of planet sizes right near this uh, one and a half Earth radius threshold. So what we think might be going on is it might be that there's a distribution of rocky planets and a distribution of planets that have a thick gaseous envelope. And we need to do more work to measure the densities of these planets and determine if, if that's what's actually going on. Uh, but this is, this is the result of um, my colleague B.J. Fulton. So to uh, sort of to conclude here, we are now in a position where we can actually find planets around other stars and measure their sizes. And we've identified different populations of planets, planets that are the size of Earth and larger and possibly, but not necessarily, uh, have rocky surfaces. We've identified planets smaller than Neptune, which exist around half of all stars and they seem to have a thick gaseous layer. And of course, we've also found some giant planets, although they seem fairly rare. So uh, I'll end there. Thank you, Dr. Weiss. Um, our two speakers, doc Dr. Pinsano is up to bat now, have agreed to speak for about 25 minutes each. Then they'll have a brief conversation time when they can grill each other with some questions. And then it's our turn to do the grilling. We get to ask the questions. So I now introduce Professor Mark Pinsonneau.
I'm a wanderer, so I'll probably use the talk wandering mic because that's just how I am. Uh, I have a Fitbit and I get my steps during classes, so there you go. Um, so one of the great things about science, one of the things I absolutely love about being an astronomer is the fact that we, um, we work in unexpected ways, we do things in ways that we otherwise wouldn't have thought, and you heard about Kepler being a mission to discover planets. That's absolutely true. That's how it was designed. But in science, one of the really wonderful things about astronomy is we end up using telescopes and missions in ways that nobody thought we would actually be able to pull off. And we actually make a lot of discoveries that we would not have expected. In fact, on the Kepler satellite, only about half of the papers published from Kepler are actually on planets. The other half are on stars or galaxies or explosions or other things that are completely different. Uh, and that's because when you design a new experiment, sometimes it just does things that you don't actually anticipate. And so what I'm going to be talking about today is I'm going to be talking about actually detecting waves, sound waves, inside stars and using them to figure out what's going on in the middle of a star very, very far away using exactly the same data that Lauren uses to discover planets, which is actually a really kind of cool thing. Now, one of the backgrounds for this is that astronomy is a very interdisciplinary uh, science. Uh, so I'm showing you up here. This is an image from the Alma radio array in Chile of a disk, a protoplanetary disk. It's around a young star. We believe that these gaps are caused by planets sweeping out gaps and clearing out debris inside this disk. This is a planetary system in the process of being built. Um, here, you're looking at a simulation in a computer, the formation of a galaxy like our Milky Way. I have colleagues uh, a couple doors down who do one thing, colleagues a couple doors down who do the other thing, right? And we talk to each other about these things. And one of the common links is you'd really like to be able to understand things like the ages of the stars in order to be able to do kind of reconstructions of how our galaxy formed. Um, somebody like Lauren might actually care about how big the stars are. Um, or, for example, what their mass is, um, how long they've lived, how long that system has been around, how it's changed, right? All these things are there. And you actually need to be able to understand the properties of the stars. And to be completely truthful, that's actually why I went to work on stars in the first place, was precisely that it had all these tentacles. I could write papers on the Big Bang, or I could write papers on planets or galaxies or whatever it is, and they're all kind of tied to the things that I'm actually interested in doing. Now, you say something like an age, but one of the problems in astronomy is we have things that we would like to know, but sometimes they're really hard to measure. And I'd like to use this as an example. There was a feature in the New York Times where they had four pictures of four sisters taken once a year for 40 years in a row. And one of the things I like to do this is you look at this, and this is actually, they're young, and you can kind of tell that these are young women. Here they're older, right? Uh, but if you're in the middle, it's actually kind of really hard to tell exactly how old they are. We, most of us probably couldn't tell if these women are in their 30s, their 40s, their early 50s. You might be able to have a hard time doing that. And stars are actually very much like that too, right? Um, basically, once a star's in middle age, it doesn't change very much. And it's really, really hard to be able to figure it out. The other thing is that it's very, very difficult to be able to figure out things like the size of stars. Because after all, a star could be bright because it's close, or it could be bright because it's huge and it's really far away. It's really hard to tell. And that actually has driven a lot of research in astronomy to be able to take these points of light and be able to figure out what's actually going on in them. And so this is our basic problem. Our basic problem is that we actually only see the surfaces of stars. And so if we could see inside, we could actually be able to figure out things like how much of their fuel have they burned. Uh, we might be able to work out what their densities are, how big they are, these other things. And so the surface properties of stars are actually quite deceptive in a way. When Lauren was alluding to the fact that these properties we had had changed, right, that we had different radii that we had for these stars, the underlying data is actually the same, it's just ambiguous. Uh, with the initial information that we had, you actually couldn't really tell exactly how big the stars were, and as a result, you couldn't tell exactly how big the planets were, and you smeared your data all out. But if you can look inside, things actually get different. And so I'm going to tell you the story of how this happens. This is, I love this image, this is from the Swedish Solar Telescope. This is a snapshot in time of the surface of the sun. The sun is boiling at the surface, and every cool star is like the sun. So if you take a look at most of the stars in the universe, they have surfaces that are very, very much like the sun. 
Now you take one of these boiling things, and then you let it go, and you actually get an image. This is a time-lapse image taken from the gong network, and you see all this flickering here, all this kind of back and forth on this thing. That's because when the sun is boiling, there's things that get brighter and colder. They come back and forth. They collide with one another. And whenever I have giant balls of gas that collide with one another, I create shocks and I create waves. The same waves that I'm talking to you about happen in the sun. Okay? And so you can also look at this. You may notice that there appear to be very regular patterns in here. Things appear to be flickering kind of in unison, and that's actually important. That's actually part of the signal that I'm going to be talking about. And so you have two different kinds of waves. A sound wave, if you're hearing me, is because the air between you and me is being compressed and stretched back and forth in between you and me. You can also have water waves when a cork's bobbing up and down. And for the purpose of this story, both of these things happen inside the sun. I told you the sun has a turbulent layer on the outside, so that makes sound waves. There's a stable layer at the bottom. When those sound waves hit it, it's like putting your hand on top of a table. It's like banging on a drum. And so you create waves in the middle of the sun, you create them in the outside. And so I'm trying to convince you that that has to happen. This has to happen, that there's these sound waves rattling around inside the sun. But as we all know, in space, no one can hear you scream. And so part of the problem here is, of course, how could we possibly know that a star like the sun has all of these sound waves bouncing around in it? Because it seems completely impossible that that could ever do anything interesting to us. And the short answer is that you have a star like the sun, and you have to remember that the sun is actually um, remarkably different at the surface than it is at the inside. If you had the sun and you let it to, if there was just gravity, in half an hour it would implode and become a black hole. Okay, so the fact that the sun is still there, still going to be there, guarantee you, is telling you that there's something holding the sun up. And what's holding the sun up is the same thing that's holding the air above us up. That is the fact that basically there's a balance between pressure and gravity. Okay? To give you a feel of what that does, the surface of the sun is a thousand times less dense than the air that you're breathing. It's practically a vacuum. Okay? It's like 6,000 degrees, but it's practically a vacuum. The center of the sun is a gas. It's a gas that's 30 times denser than a block of iron, okay? And that difference between the top and the bottom is what's preventing the sun from collapsing. But what you see here is if you take a tank of water and you run a wave through it, there's a place where it's a little bit thin, the wave bends. And so if you're in the sun, you go down, you're seeing a density that's different, the wave bends. It goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. When I was a kid, I had a toy called the spirograph. It makes a spirograph pattern. It's actually kind of a lot like that. That's kind of what you're seeing here. And so what's happening here, plug in your PC now, close. I think I can make it. So what's happening here is you're going up and down, up and down, back and forth. And these waves come back up to the place where they started. And so you have kind of a standing wave. And so in order to see what a standing wave looks like, we have some wonderful simulations. This is one of them. This is a sloshing pan. The surface of the sun and every other star is actually doing this. But every time it goes out, remember, it gets cold. And every time it goes in, it gets hot. And so if you were looking at a star like this, you'd see one side getting hot, one side getting cold. In other words, it gets brighter and fainter. And you can see that. OK? There's other modes, too. Um, this is my one of my personal favorites, is the uh, bouncing ball mode. Um, this is the surface of the star going up and down like this. Initially, this looks impossible, by the way, but it turns out that when the top goes down, the middle, the center of the star goes up, so the star isn't actually projecting itself like a rocket through space, so there's no, no danger there. And so you have these various little modes, and uh, this one just because I can. Uh, but you remember that a star like the sun isn't oscillating with just one of these things. It's oscillating with all of them at the same time. And so when we look at our data in the sun, we see 100,000 different frequencies that it's oscillating in. We can measure them as a function of the size and the space. It's an incredibly rich kind of an oboe, if you will, of a, of a musical instrument, rather than being a nice, clean little flute. 
Now, if you're trying to look at the stars, you might want to look at Kepler. And Kepler is a gorgeous mission. Now, of course, we can't actually resolve the surface of Kepler. And that means you're not going to be able to find any of these modes, which are really complicated, little ones back and forth. But if you have the mode where one side of the star is getting brighter and one side's getting fainter, you can absolutely see that in space. Okay? And this is real Kepler data taken for different stars. And you may notice here that you see this rattling around, so it's not a simple period, like a planet transit. And that's because you're looking at basically interference between a bunch of these modes all at the same time. You're not seeing one frequency, you're seeing many of them. And you notice that the big star has big amplitude, long period changes, right? And you notice that the small star has short, low amplitude, rapid changes. And that's because basically the frequency of these sound waves depends on the density of the star. Okay, so if a star is really dense, sound moves really fast, and if the density is really low, sound moves really slowly. And so in fact, I can just look at this light curve and say this has to be a big star and this has to be a small star before I've done anything else. And remember, this is just from taking a movie of it. A movie, by the way, that was not designed to do this. Kepler was not built to do this at all. And in fact, in these stars, these red giant branch stars, nobody even thought they oscillated before Kepler and Corot launched. And so now what you do is you take a spectrum of this, see where you have power. And this kind of background here is the noise of that boiling in the surface I told you about. This is how much power there is at each frequency. Whenever you see spikes like this, these spark sharp spikes, this is telling you there are specific frequencies where the star actually has a standing wave pattern. This is a star that has a very high gravity. These modes are far apart and the frequencies are high. In the sun, this is about five minutes, okay? And then as it goes to higher gravities, the modes get closer together, they move down, the power gets higher, the frequencies get lower. And so I can look at this pattern and I can read out what the density and size of the star are. And so on the data that Lauren was talking about, and so now the idea here is that we can actually use this to figure out how big, for example, the stars might actually be, what their masses might be like, how long they live. And this is a zoom in on this data just to show you how beautiful the data from Kepler is. For scientists like me, I look at data like this, this is gorgeous, okay? This is the kind of data we'd get in the sun, except it's for stars. You see that there's a characteristic kind of frequency where there's maximum power. This is what I meant when the sun is like five minutes. You see that we have this spacing. You see all these zeros, these are the kind of mode it is. Each one of these is an overtone. So if you're a musician, you're seeing a bunch of overtones in this, okay? This is the overtones of one mode. This is the overtones of the fundamental, first harmonic, second harmonic, and so forth. So you're seeing all of this stuff here. If you look carefully, they're actually all split by the rotation, so you can work out how it's spinning inside as well, okay? And so this gives us a kind of a working tool for bulk populations. And so this is um, a couple of hundred of our discovery spectra, where we look at the frequencies here. You may notice that these stars are luminous. This is hot, bright, faint cold, hot. You notice if they're luminous, the power over here is kind of high, the frequencies are low, you go down here, the power gets low, the frequencies get high, you can actually see the kind of data we're getting from these Kepler light curves from this. So instead of, you can take these light curves, you look for planet transits, and then you can take the same light curve and you can do this, and then you can figure out the sound waves, you can see the stars rattling around in the background. And so that means that I can actually figure out whether a star is big or small, whether it's massive or low mass, um, any of these other properties just from looking at the light curve, except I also kind of would like to know what the star's made of and how hot it is, and the Kepler light curves don't tell me that. And that's why you actually need to add an extra tool. And this is where ground-based data comes in. Um, what Lauren was referring to earlier, she's part of a big survey actually in the Keck telescope, right? Um, and the Keck telescope um, actually was taking spectra from the ground. Um, we're actually part of a massive um, survey called the Apogee survey. Uh, and in the Apogee survey, what we have is we have an automated way of taking an enormous number of spectra of stars. And for the people here who are interested in things like big data, this is a big data problem, because we get 100,000 spectra or 200,000 high-resolution spectra of stars, um, which are enormously large and contain tens of thousands of spectral features. 
Um, you can't get that many graduate students, and they wouldn't want to do it anyway. And so you actually have to be able to design kind of automated pipelines that analyze this, and that's actually a big piece of the work we do, is to try to design pipelines that can automatically analyze these enormous data sets that nobody can actually look at altogether. And when we do it, we get data like this. This is a 100,000 high-resolution spectra of stars analyzed. The color coding tells you the abundance of the star. Blue has very little iron, red has a lot. This is the temperature, this is the gravity. And this was not imposed on the data. This is the result of the solution of the equations, the solution that we get. And this is beautiful to me because we tell people stories. We say that we think that stars are like this, and then you collect this data, and it's actually true. It actually, physics works. It's, it's great. It's great. Okay. And so then the result of this is we can actually now do what I would call galactic archaeology because all of a sudden we actually can measure the masses of stars. And so with Kepler, we have 20,000 red giants, which we can use to measure masses and ages of stars across the entire galaxy. For reference, before Kepler, we had a couple of hundred binary stars where we had fundamental mass measurements. Okay? Couple hundred, really good mass measurements. We have 500 or 600 stars that are very much like the sun. And in fact, this data set here, which we're about to be publishing, this is a revised sort of 400 stars that are actually great ones, is one of the ones that people like Eric and others have used to actually calibrate or figure out that these revised radii of the um, planet host is actually correct, because they reproduce these very, very precise, exquisite properties that we deduce from these sound waves. And so as a result, they can use this on the many, much larger sample they're interested in of planet hosts that don't have this seismic signal. This is how we work together. You know, I'm doing the seismology, not a planet guy, not at all. Don't do planets. Planets are great, not me. Uh, I do stars. Uh, and then, but the things that I do can be used for people who actually are interested in stars. And then for the last, last slide I have here, this kind of diagram is the luminosity or gravity and temperature uh, of stars. Now, when we look at stars in the field, we normally can't tell whether they're close or far, how big or bright they are. Um, this is data for almost 7,000 stars in the Kepler field. We know the masses and ages of every single one of them. And the last point I wanted to make, tell you here is that if you look at the points in red, if we look at the frequencies of these things, these things have a frequency pattern that tells us there's something, the mass of the sun and the size of the earth buried in the middle. And we can actually look at the frequency pattern and tell that's true. And these are things that actually are burning helium in a core, hydrogen in a shell, their structure is different. The blue is telling you that their frequency pattern is different. In other words, I've seen two completely different populations of stars, evolved stars, burned out cinders, what happens to the sun when it will get old. Uh, and these two different populations of stars are distinguished by the things we see on the inside, not by their surface properties, but you can tell that this group is hotter and this group is colder, and that's actually a fundamental prediction of the theory of stellar structure and evolution, which is validated by looking at the sound waves traveling around inside of a star, which I think is really pretty neat. And I'm going to stop at that point. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vincenno. Maybe our two speakers will, if they like, ask a few questions of each other, and then it's our turn. So think of some good ones. <laughs> okay, après vous. <laughs> so, so, uh, so, um, so I guess one question I had is you talked about detecting planets, and um, how do you know how a planet got where it is? Um, well, that's a, that's a pretty tricky question. So um, even in our own solar system, where we actually know where all of the planets are really precisely today, except for maybe planet nine, um, even in our own solar system, we don't really fully understand the history of where the planets have been at different points in time since the, since the formation of the sun and of the planets themselves. Um, 
So there are, there are various theories uh, for the solar system that are actually pretty complicated and have the planets moving around. So one of my favorite theories has actually has the, the giant planets, Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, they actually, it's called migrate, which just means move inward toward the star. And then they actually um, end up reversing direction and moving back out. And that's called the Grand Tack Model. It's named after sailing, where if you're like moving one way and then you do a tack, you just cut out at a different angle. Um, that theory was proposed to explain the small size of Mars and some of the compositional features in the asteroid belt. Now, we're not yet quite at the level with exoplanet systems where we're like trying to explain, say, the size of Mars analogs, and we don't yet have detections of exo-asteroids per se. Um, but we, we do have some pretty big questions where the exoplanets that Kepler has found have just cracked open our previous ideas about planet formation, all of which were based on the solar system, and, and sort of like put, put some of them just on the cutting room floor. So some theories just really aren't um, good anymore. So of course, in our own planetary system, Mercury is the closest planet to the sun. It has an orbital period of 88 days. But the vast majority of, uh, of the Kepler stars, and indeed, statistically speaking, of all stars, have one or even two planets that are closer to their star than Mercury is to our sun. And so we don't understand yet how, how is it that most other stars have planets that are sort of between the size of Earth and Neptune that got so close to their stars. That was not at all predicted by our previous theories of planet formation. Actually, the opposite prediction was made, one of a, a planet desert of planets of that size and in that particular region of space. So now people, um, there, there's sort of like two ideas to explain these planets. One is that they formed further out where there are more abundant um, icy materials that could have formed them, that they formed out there and then migrated in. And the other idea is that they formed, we use a Latin phrase, in situ, to describe them forming just where we see them today. And the idea in that case is that they haven't been disturbed by giant planets like Jupiter, and that they were able to just form and persist. So we actually, to I guess go back to answering your question, we don't know how the planets got to where they are today. Uh, that's one of the things that I'm actually most interested in trying to study over the next 10 years. So, um, yeah, so one thing that um, would definitely help me in this endeavor is, as you alluded to, getting better stellar properties, especially uh, sizes and masses, so that we can know the compositions of planets, but also ages, uh, because for most stars, they're kind of like middle-aged. We don't really know their ages. So can, can you tell me a little bit more about how advances in the next few years will help us better identify stellar ages? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Because one of the things is that if there's, sometimes there are things that you think are important that are actually kind of easy to measure. And there's things that you think are important that are hard. And so if I wanted to measure the temperature of a star, I basically I have a lot of tools to do that. Right? I, can actually, I can actually look at whether it puts out more blue light or red light. I can look at whether it has, um, it has features in its spectrum that actually tell me that it's hot or cold or things like that. Um, but an age is a problem because an age is never something that we directly measure. The only object that we actually get a real age for is the sun because we have rocks. Okay, so we can break rocks apart, meteorites in the early solar system, we can work out their ages from radioactive decay. That's actually the, almost the only direct astronomical age. Everything else involves somebody like me making a model, and then having it have a bunch of properties and saying, hey, that property looks kind of like a billion-year-old star or whatever it is. It's not actually ever direct. Um, one of the things we can do is those modes I told you about. Let's imagine that I have a mode that goes only near the surface, okay? And now we have another mode that goes right through the middle and all the way to the other side. Well, if it goes right through the middle, it actually cares about how much hydrogen has been turned into helium. Yeah. Okay? So that's actually a measure of age. 
And so if I compare those two frequencies, I can actually get an age just from the frequencies of a star. And our data from the test mission, which is upcoming, uh, from Kepler and others, is actually going to be good enough for us to be able to do that. The test satellite, which is going to be launching, is going to give us stars that we can do that kind of work in. Kepler has 400 of them. TESS will have like 20,000. OK. The other thing is that there's a satellite called Gaia, which is being launched. And Gaia is going to me measure ultra-precise positions in the galaxy. It's basically going to give us a 3D map of our galaxy. It's amazing, by the way, we live in a time when this is all happening. You know, It's sort of like, you know, we have this satellite coming. Oh, by the way, we're going to have a complete map of our galaxy. Astronomers have been working for decades to figure out how far away things are. We'll give it right, right there. It's amazing. And so if you have that, then actually you know important things about the stars, and you can combine this in ways that's going to use super precise numbers. And so I'd contend that starting next year, we're going to start having ages that actually really mean something. Uh, and then whether or not it helps you or me depends upon what the answers are. If our models work out great, then she has a bunch of ages. And if our models don't work out great, I have fun. And so it's either way it works. So based on that, let's say Let's say you mentioned that you knew something about the compositions of these things, OK? Well, let's say I have something like a couple times the size of the Earth. It could be a rocky thing, as you mentioned. Uh, but is it possible I could actually have something like one of these hot planets that came in that kind of like just got eroded, like I had a Neptune that boiled away or something? How could I tell the difference between a thing that used to be big and got small and something that was always just sitting there? Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. So what Mark is alluding to is that almost all of the rocky planets that we have found with Kepler and then determined to be rocky by measuring their masses and densities are extremely hot. They're very close to their stars. They orbit the star in anywhere from less than a day to maybe like 10 days. And so at, th at these orbital distances, they have temperatures um, upward of 2,000 degrees, and it doesn't even matter what units that's in. Um, so the energy from the star, uh, that, that close to the star, is actually enough to physically remove gaseous layers from planets. So uh, a question that's uh, been around for a while is whether these rocky planets that we have found super close to their stars, were they born rocky? Or did the star change them and make them rocky? So actually, there's, just, there's a new paper um, out, by, out by our colleague Josh Wynn where he actually looked at the metal compositions of, um, of a bunch of these stars that host close-in rocky planets. And the idea was to try to understand, um, based on sort of how much rocky material these stars have in their atmosphere, whether or not that's consistent with the planet having been born rocky. And, and actually, the way this works is we, all, we already know from previous statistical work that stars that have a lot of metals in their atmosphere are much more likely to have giant, like Jupiter-sized planets. So, um, so he found that actually these stars have pretty ordinary amounts of metals in their atmosphere. So it, it doesn't seem like these close and rocky planets could be the cores of Jupiter-sized planets, but they could still be the cores of, of Neptune-sized planets where the gas has all been removed. And so I think really to understand that, we're going to have to get a lot better at understanding how, um, how stellar properties correlate with what kind of planets form around those particular types of stars. So I could have a slush world. Like what? I could have a slush world then. A slush world? Well, you could have an icy, icy Neptune that melted. Yeah. You could have a slush world instead <laughs> oh, of a rock yeah. world. Oh, yeah. Totally, yeah. Or even like like some of these worlds, are they, they could have like water or ice. But actually, like for a lot of them, we think that they have thick layers of hydrogen as well, um, which, which actually Neptune has, Neptune and Uranus. We call them ice giants. Like that's the, I don't know, sort of elementary school term and up for them. But then... I don't know, at some point we stop 
Well, because they, they have like a thick layer of hydrogen on them, you know, right? They, they do have the water, like the watery ice layer, but they also have the hydrogen. And we haven't actually, well, we've, we've found water in some exoplanets, but we haven't actually found water in, um, in very many of these um, Neptune-sized planets yet. So that's something, that's something we're hoping to look for with James Webb. All right, maybe we can have some questions from the audience and to get us in the mood. I hope you don't mind if, if I get to ask a question here. I wonder, uh, Lauren, you've told us about Kepler's observations of dimming light curves, that is of stars varying in brightness because of the passage of a planet in front. But Mark, you, you've told us about stars varying in brightness because of sound waves bouncing inside of the star. Can Kepler or can its scientists easily distinguish those two kinds of variation in brightness? Yeah, one key thing is that is the planet signals are very regular. Planet goes around once a year, dips once a year. The stuff that I'm that I the sound waves are kind of more irregular. They give you these kind of choppy up and down light curves that are that are up and down. Incidentally, by the way, this actually was one reason why um, it was super hard for the radio velocity people to find planets around giants, because they started looking for planets around red giant branch stars, and they saw the velocities rattling all over the place in ways they couldn't figure out, and it turned out it was actually these sound waves. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So what Mark what Mark is referring to is um, the this other technique where we find planets or, or study their masses. And to, to do that, we are actually trying to measure the wobble of the star in space. Uh, we do that, we don't actually look for the star like physically moving on the sky, although we're about to with this new telescope, Gaia. What's actually a lot easier to do is see the star wobbling forward and back uh, because of how it compresses light waves. Yeah. And, uh, and so you can, we actually do see stars moving forward and back due to their planets, but the light's coming from the surface of the star, not the center of the star. So when the stars oscillate and pulse and do all those weird jiggly dances that, that Mark showed us, uh, we, capture, we capture that stuff too, even when we don't want it. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, uh, their noise is my signal. And, and, and their noise is my signal. <laughs> How about some more questions? No, if, if you can capture sound waves, do you have recordings of sounds of the stars? Problem is the sun is a five minute frequency and these giants are like 12 hours. That'd be real low. <laughs> we, could, we could try to <laughs> restyle this. And so, and so they're way outside the audible range. The only, it is true oh. that there are little white dwarf stars that actually would get into the audible human range, these things that are the mass of the sun and the size of the Earth. But, but for the most part, these are very low frequency. Oh, darn. <laughs> yeah, and, and, are, and are the sound waves coherent? Um, like, even if you scaled up the frequency, would it actually sound like something if we could well, know, because, hear there? Well, because, because you'd have a whole bunch of frequencies at the same time. Mm -hmm. so, so it would sound really fuzzy. Um, oboe, not flute. Uh. Hi. Yeah. I have kind of two questions. The first one is about what you said about, like, if, sorry, I'm really far. If the, okay. If, like, you had, like, part of a bigger icy, icy giant, yeah, that had, like, blown away, if there were, like, en like enough, wouldn't that affect the spectroscopy data of the star and you could detect that? gas or would not be enough? Oh, so you're thinking about like if the gas from the planet then like fell onto the star? No, but if it was like around the area of the star, would you mm. be able to see that? Yeah, yeah. So actually there are some, we can, we can also actually just see it with, with uh, transit tools like Kepler. So there, there have been um, detections where people have looked um, at, at a transiting planet, or what they expected to just be a transiting planet, but they looked at very special wavelengths of light that um, that interact with the molecular um, and, and atomic hydrogen that gets blown off of the planet. And so what they see actually is when the planet transits the star, um, at this particular wavelength of light, there will be like a huge transit um, blocking like 50% of the star's light. And that's just because this 
um, evaporating gas from the planet uh, is, is blocking the light, but it, it's only blocking the light at this one wavelength where the gas and the light are interacting. So we see that in transit. We're going to look for it in more spectroscopic detail with, uh, with James Webb when it launches, so stay tuned for that. Okay. And the second one was a few months ago. There was this thing that came out, and they had, um, they had claimed to um, directly image a system of exoplanets. And I remember I, I looked in, because I run a blog about like space and stuff. And I looked into that because I was like, I don't want to like just post this if it's not legit. <laughs> but I found it on like multiple sites mm -hmm. that seem pretty refutable. So I was wondering like, how did they do that? Yeah, I think you're probably thinking about HR 8799. Had like a little GIF or GIF video of like the planets actually going around the star. So that's actually real. Um, this is one of the only planetary systems out there that has been directly imaged. So. So I told maybe, I guess, a little bit of a white lie when I said that we don't like see planets directly. I qualified it with we don't see planets that are small and close to their stars. So um, if a planet is far enough away from its star, and if the planet is super, super young, which means that it's still hot with the heat of its formation, it actually glows bright enough in infrared wavelengths that we can see it and actually separate the light from the planet from the light of the star. So HR 8799 is a system of multiple planets that are orbiting a massive young star. And these planets are all like five to 10 times the mass of Jupiter. They're ginormous. And they're super, they're young, they're super hot. And um, we've been following this system for enough years now that Actually, a colleague of mine, a grad student who's still at Cal, um, finishing up his PhD, he was like, oh, I can make a movie of this. And then it like, went viral, which was cool. Um, yeah, but we also even have um, some spectral data of each of those planets and can look for uh, molecules in their atmospheres. So that's, that's going on, too. Thank you. Dr. Weiss. Uh, sort of a two-part question. Also, <clears throat> you mentioned that the resolution capability of the Kepler uh, craft is limited to Earth size is the bottom of the So first part, is that not related to the distance at which the object is? Oh, well, uh, we, could, we could try that out here. So uh, I guess oh, you're, you're unplugged. Right, you unplugged that. Um, yeah, so actually, the distance between the um, the planet and the star doesn't affect the signal of a single dip in brightness. The single dip in brightness is only based on the comparison of the size of the planet and star and qualified by the fact that the planet has to transit. Because you're you limiting your data set to just sun, uh, to stars similar in size to our sun. Um, yeah, I mean, if, if the star is bigger and the planet is Earth-sized, Right, that's, that's going to be too hard for Kepler to detect. But Kepler found a lot of Earth-sized and even Mars and Mercury-sized planets around smaller stars, which was pretty cool. Okay. Um, but actually, you, you did hit on something here about like distance mattering. So even though the depth of the transit doesn't depend on distance, the more transits of a single planet we see, the better a detection we can get. Because we can add up the signal of all those transits together. Um, so with the, like the long period planets, um, like Earth-sized planets out at a year, um, part of the reason that Kepler didn't find as many of those is there just weren't as many transits of them during the limited four-year Kepler mission. So we really need the, something kind of like Kepler, but that just goes longer than four years. Well, but, but there, one, one other neat thing, though, is that a star is actually not a light bulb. Uh, so, uh, so, so one other problem, which I can show you actually with the my screen, that would be the sun. I like the sun. That's a Soho image of the sun. And so there's actually a variability in the background too, right? And so in addition to the, to the things, the important pieces that, uh, that uh, you were talking about, there's also the factor that the sun is actually not quiet and that acts as a kind of a noise. And that means if a planet's too small, it gets buried in the noise. And so the truth about Kepler is Kepler was 
right at the edge of being able to see Earths. I mean, right at the edge, because it turned out that stars were noisier than we thought they were. I think that's at least my understanding. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. I think I think we're still not quite sure what happened with that. Whether it's that stars, either it's that like all of the stars that are not the sun are secretly like have more star spots and more activity than the sun, or that the instrument, the Kepler instrumentation, wasn't quite as good as we hoped it would yeah, be. Yeah. Um, you can you can uh, you can tease out your own pick among those choices. I'll let I'll let you think about that. Um, so I know another way to find exoplanets is through uh, gravitational lensing, but. How exactly would you be able to detect an exoplanet in a system like that? Yeah. Oh, could we could we do a live demo of this? Okay. All right. So. Um, oh, do you want me to be the lens or the source? Um. Actually, let's. You're going to be the star, and I'm going to be the planet. And let's say the source is your beautiful sun up okay. there. How about that? Okay. Great. All right. So we have a, a light source. Let's say it's the bul the galactic bulge, which is just the bright center of the Milky Way galaxy, which has many stars. Mark and I are a, a star and a planet. I'm, I'm orbiting him, but let's just, let's not try to do that. But we're moving through the galaxy too. And when we cross the background source, what ends up happening is our, our mass gravitationally bends the light of the background source. And so from your point of view as the observer, there's a moment when this background source brightens. And the way that it brightens and the amount of time over which it brightens and then dims is what tells you, oh, a massive star just passed between the source and you. But then um, a short time later, there'll be another spike in the light that's from the planet. And based on the amount of time that these brightenings happen, uh, you can figure out the masses of the objects. And based on how far apart in time they happen, you can figure out how close or far from, from my star I am. And, and you use the uh, star as kind of your, your, your alert that there might be a planet there. Because you see the star going by, and then you just stare at it and just see if you see a little blip. Yeah, right? yeah. or so vice versa. Uh, because cause the idea yeah, can happen the other way, too. But usually yeah. the star is big. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, and so in effect, what you do is you have this kind of way of, because um, the, the advantage of this, they're close together compared to the distance between them. It's a brilliant technique, finding planets you can't see around stars you can't see. Yeah. It's awfully hard to study them again, though, because once they've passed by the bright source, you don't necessarily know which direction they came from or went or when they're going to pass another bright source again. So it's just like you get the one shot. So gravitational microlensing studies, um, well, they do find some really cool planets, but one thing they're really working on is statistics, is counting up what kinds of planets they find and how often they find them, because they can almost never go back and look at the same planetary system again. Yeah. So I'm going to be greedy with, with two questions. Two, one, one maybe you're tired of. I don't know, I don't remember the name, but you know, alien superstructure. That's all I have to say. What's the theory? Because all I read is in the press, having two live scientists What's going on with that star? What, where does that star fit on your graphs? What is your theory as to what's happening? Oh, man. So I, I, I have like some stuff about this. Do you want to say anything about this first? Or? Um, I think it's fair to say that most of my colleagues would eat their shoes if it was actually an alien megastructure. I would. I would. Uh, but, uh, but. <laughs> Okay. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So the basic idea is we normally have our light curves, and a transit light curve is nice and flat, has a dip, goes back up again, right? And then every once in a while, you'll see a light curve that's wobbling around, and that's the sound waves I was talking about. And then sometimes you get bizarro light curves where you stare back and say, what the devil is that? Where you see something that actually is a big, coherent kind of dip or change in brightness with sharp little edges. And so as a result, the basic issue you have here is we had one of these things where the light curve didn't make any sense. And if it doesn't make any sense, yeah, you can unplug it. Um, then what you do is you start cooking up ideas that are a little bit unusual. And 
somebody somewhere said, oh, well, clearly, if you had a gigantic alien megastructure orbiting a star, it would go around, it would block the light, it'd have nice little sharp edges, and you get a light curve that looks like that. And I look at this and I see goo orbiting around a star that's actually clumpy goo that's orbiting around a star and blocking light. But Yeah, or gas or something. Yeah, or, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, they're kind of, so basically, these are the data, right? This, this is the same exact experiment that we played with earlier. So the question is, how do you make that with this kind of transit setup? Um, so there've been a lot of theories about like, oh, maybe it could be some clumps of gas that are orbiting the star and gas is turbulent. So the gas would sort of roil around and you wouldn't always get a regular repeating pattern. You would get this kind of maybe more chaotic um, dip structure. So that's a great idea, but often when a star is orbited by a bunch of gas, the gas is heated by the starlight, and then the gas glows in the infrared. So when we looked at this star with infrared, um, with, uh, at infrared wavelengths, we didn't see that glowing from the gas. So it's kind, kind of a bad sign for the gas hypothesis. So then people started saying, well, maybe it's not gas. Maybe it's like a bunch of dusty, rocky stuff, like comets that are breaking up in front of the star. Um, so that's that's one hypothesis, and then of course, basically what happened is we like we kind of ran out of ideas. So someone just joked, "Oh, alien megastructure," um, and that that really caught on, uh, which is which is great because it raises awareness of like the cool science that Kepler is doing and the fact that hey, maybe we could find alien megastructures. Yeah. As Mark said, if this really is the sign of an alien megastructure, I will eat my shoe. Um, <laughs> But, but it's so, it's also slowly dimming over time, which yeah. is not explained except for more. Yeah, so growing, that's right? yeah. So so these data were observed by Kepler, um, and it happened once during the Kepler mission, and then the dimming stopped. And then Kepler, I don't know if you guys know this, Kepler had some stability issues and couldn't keep looking at its original field of view anymore. So. Um, people have been following up this star with, with telescopes from the ground, though, because these dimmings are pretty big. They're actually big enough that we, don't, that we can see them despite Earth's atmosphere. So uh, just a, a few weeks ago, uh, the network of, of ground-based telescopes found another one of these dimming events starting. And you were like, Tabby tweeted about it. Everyone was like on high alert. Oh my gosh, if you have telescope time, look at the star. It's dimming. We don't know what's going on. And like... I mean, we're scientists, we love an unsolved mystery. So I don't care if it's alien megastructures or not, I, I wanted to look at it. And I actually, um, one thing I did during my PhD is I automated uh, a robotic telescope that's at Lick Observatory on Mount Hamilton. So if you wanna like take a drive up there, bring a picnic lunch and go for a tour. Uh, the tour guides are super nice. You can go check out the historic telescope there and stuff like that. You can't actually look at the, you can't go into the telescope that I, automated unfortunately it's not like a visitor's telescope you can go to the outside though and like take a photo in front of it it looks kind of like a scoop of ice cream a big white scoop of ice cream <laughs> um and so that that's a telescope that's taking high resolution spectra of stars to look for this wobble thing to find planets but we figured hey we've got time why don't we take a look at tabby's star and see if we can see um any, any changing features in the spectrum over time, because if, the, if light is changing in different ways at different wavelengths of light, that would, could correspond to, um, to a particular composition of material passing in front of the star and occulting it. And if we could identify the composition of the material or, or where it is or what temperature it's at, uh, that, would, that would be an awesome contribution. So we... Yeah, so we got some data, and I gave it to my summer student. So we'll see if she finds anything. <laughs> and so one other quick question. Uh, again, I forget the exact date, but 100 or so years ago, we had a super uh, sunspot, basically. Ejection, mass ejection, burnt down telegraph offices. But there weren't electronics at the time. And aren't we approximately due for this to happen again? And besides seeing the aurora borealis right here in the Bay Area, wouldn't that 
be catastrophic and how are we not insane for not preparing for it? I mean, wouldn't that cause, would that only wipe out the half of the earth facing the sun at the time? Can you, can you give me an idea, like, what, what you know? <laughs> well, one of the things I do do actually is study the sun, so that's kind of in my roundhouse. Um, the Carrington event is what you're talking, the Carrington event what you're talking about is a massive, massive flare. And, um, and uh, we actually, it's kind of like asteroid impacts. You have a bunch of little flares that are always popping off on the sun all the time. And then as they get bigger, there's fewer and fewer of them, but they're more and more dangerous, right? And, um, and in the case of the sun, we have some kind of a record, but our, even that flare is actually medium sized compared to the things that happen in stars. And so one of the things we have in Kepler is we can actually see these flares in Kepler too. As a matter of fact, we were sitting in a meeting earlier today where people were talking about all the big flares they discovered in stars in Kepler that were in fact much bigger in many cases than even that event. And so um, if that happened, you would have a few hours uh, warning. In fact, the, the, um, in fact, the military do have kind of space weather alert systems where they're kind of taking images of the sun to be able to see what's happening. Um, you might be able to turn some things off, but to first order, yeah, it would basically fry anything that was that was powered on on the side of the sun that it was on, on the side of the side of, day side of the uh, of the Earth. Um, and if it was sufficiently big, it might actually just kind of completely kind of uh, uh, basically wipe out like the ozone layer or something like that, the upper atmosphere of the Earth for a really extreme flare. Um, so yeah, these things could happen just like you could have big impacts. And um, we don't really understand very well the triggering mechanism for these large things. Um, you're familiar with the sunspot cycle? Um, because you have the sunspot cycle, and so what we think happens in the sunspot cycle is the sun bundles up a bunch of magnetic fields on the inside. They get twisted so much that they bubble to the top and they show up as sunspots. That happens every 11 years. We don't really understand why it winds up hard sometimes and less than others. We're trying, actually using the tools of the seismology I was talking about. Yeah, I think, I think magnetism is one of the hardest, um, hardest things we have to deal with in the universe as astronomers, like harder than black holes, for sure. I wonder if insurance companies do sell solar flare insurance. Perhaps that's a, a Wonderfest should sell solar flare insurance. If any of you'd like to buy some, let me know. We have a last question for our esteemed speakers. You've got two astronomers here. I have a quick question. What is the maximum number of planets detected going around one of the single stars that were detected. Oh, okay, cool. So what's, so what's the maximum number that we've detected so far of planets around a single star? Uh, well, I'd have to say what, that would be our solar system. We've got eight planets, nine if you count Pluto. Around another star, it's seven, and there are actually two stars that hold that record. One is one of the Kepler stars, Kepler 90, uh, which is actually a really cool system. It's got a bunch of these, like, sort of between Earth and Neptune-sized planets, like five of them all pretty close to the star. And then at orbital periods that are actually pretty similar to the periods of Venus at Earth and Earth, it has two giant planets. Um, and so what, what, uh, one thing that I'm working on right now is measuring the masses of those giant planets to try to figure out are they more like Jupiter mass or more like Saturn mass or really low mass but with like a lot of hydrogen that makes them fluffy. Uh, so that's one of the record holders. And the other record holder is the TRAPPIST-1 system, which was just uh, uh, announced to have seven planets a few months ago. So this is actually... Um, in addition to being a record holder for the number of planets, it is the lowest mass star that we have discovered hosting planets. This star is only about a tenth the mass of the sun. Um, although, you know, some seismology or other like better, better models would help us like hone in on exactly what its mass is. Uh, so at one tenth the mass of the sun, this thing is going to live for quadrillions of years. Um, and it's got seven planets that are all um, pretty small. They're all about the size of Earth. We actually don't know their masses yet, so we don't know if they're rocky like Earth. Um, based on Kepler, we've, we've found that a lot of the um, sort of red dwarf stars, the smaller stars, 
Um, some of them do have small planets that are rocky, but some of them have small, kind of like Earth-sized planets that actually have thick hydrogen layers. So, um, so don't hold your breath too much that these Trappist planets would have like rocky surfaces with continents and that kind of thing. Uh, we're still working on that. You talked about getting zapped. <laughs> Trappist one. Bzz, bzz, bzz. Yeah, solar flares. Tons of flares. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a really active star. So even if these planets do turn out to have continents and oceans and nice things like that, I would not want to live on one. Will you please join me in giving a last round of applause for our speakers, Lauren Weiss, Mark Pinsono, and a round of applause for Box. Thank you, Matt. Matt Young, thanks very much. All right, check out wonderfest.org. Thank you very much.